Good day and welcome to the sermon for the 14th Sunday after Trinity. Just before I begin, a few announcements. Uh, I'll be away for an eye appointment this coming week to Nova Scotia and a few days of vacation. Uh, therefore, midweek service is canceled this coming Wednesday. And of course, I won't be able to be in Nova Scotia and here also at 9 a.m. on each morning. So morning prayer is off for this week as well. Also, by way of announcements, uh, the parish hall is not in use these days. Uh, of course, due to the pandemic, uh, the go-go after-school program is not able to be there, and the dancers are not planning to return either. Uh, and due, of course, to COVID restrictions, the First Spring Hill will not be using the parish hall this fall either. Speaking of midweek, uh, it's of course canceled this week, and the following week on the 23rd it will be back on. And then on the 30th, I'm going to try something new, imagine that, that is a service of Holy Communion for midweek on Wednesday, September the 30th at 5 p.m. There has been some interest expressed in uh, the return of some form of Holy Communion, uh, so this will be in an experimental nature of seeing what degree of interest exists, uh, midweek service on the 30th, 5 p.m. service of Holy Communion. I'll leave that for your consideration. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Colic Epistle and Gospel for the 14th Sunday after Trinity are very good ones indeed, and a unique package. But because the Gospel for this Sunday, Luke 17, verse 11 and following, are the same as that appointed for Thanksgiving Day, which I'll preach on on Thanksgiving weekend, most likely, uh, I'll exclude it this day. And so I'll speak solely about the Epistle and the Gospel. The epistle is a continuation of St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians from last week, and it reads like this. If we live in the Spirit, says St. Paul, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Here ends the epistle. It is a wonderful consideration and continuation of the themes from last week's epistle. The spirit versus the flesh. And here, St. Paul continues his argument. He says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Remember last week I spoke about uh, the Spirit versus the flesh and the need the, to be in the Spirit, but it wasn't simply a matter of making up our minds that I'm only going to do good things. It was a matter of somewhat more complex than that, because the human soul is considerably more complex than that. It was a matter of the overall orientation, the direction, and the intentionality of how we lead our lives. And so St. Paul urges, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And this has two elements to it, as we learn from today's epistle, at least two elements. And one is a communal element. And I have to credit the Reverend Dr. Gary Thorne with first pointing this out to me way back in the fall of 1986 in the parish of Rodden. The communal aspect is this. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That is, to live and walk in the Spirit means necessarily a concern for the other. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. But there's also this other aspect because as well as speaking about bear ye one another's burdens, St. Paul goes on to say, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. So there's the individual onus. Uh, and implication of living and walking in the Spirit. On the one hand, there's a communal, bear ye one another's burdens, and then there's also the private, the not the private, the individual uh, responsibility, for every man shall bear his own burden. There's both a communal aspect and an individual aspect, a communal responsibility and an individual burden and responsibility as well. 
bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then just a few verses later, for every man shall bear his own burden. Both are true. It's not one or the other. It's both. Now the turn to this week's uh, uh, collect, which is a beauty. Almighty and everlasting God, give unto us the increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain that which thou dost promise, make us to love that which thou dost command, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is indeed one of those very beautiful colics found in the prayer book. First off, of course, as usual, we address Almighty God, Almighty and Everlasting God. We address the Father, and we're going to be praying in the name of the Son and the power of the Spirit. So we address the Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. And then rather than telling us something about God, other than that He's Almighty and Everlasting, we immediately go on and begin to supplicate. We say, give. And this is what we ask God to give us. Give unto us the increase of faith, hope, and charity. That's beautiful. It prays that we may increase in faith, in hope, in charity. The great three from 1 Corinthians 13. And please notice, too, that it says very carefully, give on to us the increase. It's not like we don't have any faith, any hope, any charity. Every human being, indeed, has some faith, some hope, some charity. But we as Christians pray, and hopefully we do indeed have some faith, hope, and charity within us already. We pray that we may be increased in that. That is to say, no matter how much faith, no matter how much hope, no matter how much love we have within us, we pray that God would increase all three within our souls, within our lives. We're not just enough to live in the Spirit, but to walk in the Spirit. And so we pray for an increase in faith, faith in God, faith in ourselves, faith in His providence, faith in His goodwill towards us, faith in His love to us, faith that we can grow in that love. We pray an increase in faith, and then also an increase in hope. And that's, of course, something that our society and our world needs uh, to a, a devastating degree. That is, we live in such a cynical uh, world. We live in such an apathetic world. We live in such a selfish world that the hope is sucked out of society, out of institutions, out of individuals. And so we need hope, a reason to go on, a conviction that things can get better, a conviction that even if things don't get better, we're still loved by those around us and above all by God himself. And then finally, charity or love. And this, of course, charity is used here because it is a specific reference to 1 Corinthians 13. It's not friendship, it's not affection, it's not any of those things like eros, but it is agape, God's love for us. And so we pray for an increase of charity, that we may be filled with God's love, and that we may be able to increase in sharing God's love with those around us. And so this beautiful prayer begins, give unto us the increase of faith, hope, and charity. And then we go on to say, and that we may obtain that which thou dost promise, in order that we may obtain what God promises to us. And remember the promises of God to us. He came to give us life, and not just normal life, but more abundant life. He came to forgive our sins, that we may be forgiven, because we're not perfect and we need forgiveness. And he came above all to gift us with eternal life. And so in order that we may obtain what he promises, and here's the kicker. Make us to love the thing which thou dost command. That's an extraordinary concept. We pray that God would make us to do something. Now, we as human beings, as I mentioned before, don't like being told what to do. We don't like to be told to wear a mask. We don't like to be told to wash our hands, even as children. We don't like to be told to use hand sanitizer. There's all sorts of things that we don't. We don't like to be told we have to wear our seat belts. We don't like to be told we can't smoke in a particular air. All those things, you know, they get under our skin. And so, but here, we pray that God would make us do something. And what we pray that he would make us do is love. Doesn't seem a hard thing, but indeed he tells us to love even the unlovable. We, he tells us to love the other, that neighbor we learned about last week. And so we pray, make us to love that which thou dost come, make us to love that which thou dost promise. In order that we may attain what thou dost promise, make us to love what thou dost command, and he commands two great things, 
to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Those are the commands of God that we pray He would make us do. And that is why this prayer is so extraordinary. Let us pray it again. Almighty and everlasting God, give unto us the increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain that which thou dost promise, make us to love that which thou dost command, through Jesus Christ our Lord. A beautiful prayer, a powerful prayer, a prayer to think, a prayer to consider, a prayer above all to pray this day and throughout this coming week. May it be on our lips, in our minds, and on our hearts. Thanks be to God. Amen.